Welcome to Tartarian Tales number 50. We made it this far, half of a hundred. I'm going to keep going. But this one, I wanted to introduce you to a new book, a new tales-packed book from the 1830s written by Alexander Burns. And it is a really incredible account of his travels through Tartary, and it's called Travels in Bokhara. This, a lot of the images I'm going to show you are from Bokhara throughout time, but that is going to be the book that I'm going to deal with. And this guy traveled so much around that area during the 1830s, and what he observed is very incredible. And I'm going to share one particular chapter that has a lot of Tartarian information, and then another chapter that where he, introduced, he interviews a slave and talks about the times, which I thought was very interesting as well. So this guy's travels led him to three separate volumes of stories in this Travels into Bokhara series. And it all is during the time where there's a lot of nomadic Tartars left. And the glory days are a little bit gone, but some things still live on in the stories and a lot of other things. You can just tell that the distant ancestors of these people did so much more than we can even fathom. But sadly, everything resets all the time. So Alexander Burns, thank you for Tartarian Tales number 50. And we'll discuss in between each one. But feel free to read these on your own. Definitely check it out. A lot of cool stories about this area, Persia and India, which I find very interesting. There's a lot of descriptions of castles and palaces that are incredible and fortresses with different cultures that he encounters. So it's definitely check it out. I'll be coming back to this for some future ones as well. But here we go. Let's get started with the first part. On the inroads of the Tartars with a notice of the tribes in Turkestan, Sketch of the Tartar invasions, their seats, it says on the side. We have been treating of countries which have, in different ages of the world, sent forth successive hordes to overrun and occupy the fairest regions of Asia. And our curiosity now leads us to note the present state and conditions of these various tribes of human beings. Attila and Alaric spread devastation in the empire of the Caesars. Genghis and Timur have succeeded them in more modern but equally destructive inroads. The Tartars. Through these great revolutions, we trace the ever wandering spirit of the Tartar people. But ere the first of these destroyers inflicted his calamities on Rome, we could gather the evil propensities of the race from the histories of Semiramis, Cyrus, and Alexander. Subsequent to the age of Timur, we have another eruption from the Uzbek Tartars, though it wasted its strength at the base of Hindu Kush. Interesting. From the days of Herodotus to the present time, we are presented with a state of ceaseless change and fluctuation in the countries of Central Asia. For this great storehouse of emigration, we have been referred to Kitai, the regions of northern China. But authentic history fixes it in a site far less remote. Genghis and his bands issued from the pastoral lands beyond the Jaxartes, which is also the migration seat of his successors, and may be therefore safely fixed as the cradle of Scythian, Hun, and Tartar inroad. We shall not stop to speculate on the probabilities of a country so thinly peopled, sending forth hordes which have been exaggerated by terror to thousands and hundreds of thousands. With greater reason shall we attribute the size of these armies to their increasing number as they advance to plunder and victory. A pastoral is but another name for a migratory nation, and its transfer to a near or distant country generally depends upon the ambition or spirit of a few of its leaders. This state of society is not altered in the paternal seats of Genghis and Timur, and an invader might pursue, though with limited success, the same paths of conquest. The volcano may rest for a time in a quiescent state, but the Tartar, in his erratic life, will ever sigh for new scenes, but it depends on the Khan if that passion be gratified. The disciplined valor of Russia would now arrest him on the west, and European prowess, engrafted on the legions of India, might there oppose the torrent, but in Turkey, Persia, Kabul, and China, a horde of Tartars would make the same impression as in former times. Hmm. The Tartar inroads have ever been of the most transitory nature. Neither the empires of Genghis or Timur were consolidated in the subjugation of India, afterwards affected by their successors, arose from fortuitous circumstances over which their previous inroads had had little influence. The literary world has long dwelt with an attentive and scrutinizing eye on the history of the Tartars, exercising as they ever have so great an influence over the destinies of the world. 
received opinions now present to us a vast nation in northern Asia, classed into three grand divisions under the generic name of Tartar. Wow, it's shocking how much they have stolen from us by losing all of this. Here we go. I shall elsewhere record the few facts which I gathered in the country regarding this race, but the subject partakes too much of a dissertation to be here introduced. The intermixture of the Tartars with the more western nations has brought about many changes, and the Tartar is no longer disfigured by those unseemly features which inspired disgust. But a physiognomist will not deduce from the change that the Turk of the Oxus differs from his countrymen of Yarkund, the mogul of modern writers, and far to the eastward. The Turks intermarried with the Tajiks of Mawuru Nur, much in the same manner as the Seljuks who in entered Persia formed alliances in that country. But we cannot on that account reckon them a separate race because of their beauty. The features of the Tartar have not altogether disappeared from the natives of Turkestan, and may yet be traced in small eyes, flattened foreheads, in a scanty beard, though we see not of the hideous visages which are described in the records of their inroads. The well-known couplet, which it goes to, it has a, it has a uh, asterisk that said, If I could but captivate the heart of that turkey girl of Shiraz, I would give in exchange for the black mole of her cheek all the riches of Samarkand and Bokhara. So interesting. The well-known couplet of Hafiz that paints the beautiful turkey girl of Shiraz near Samarkand has been celebrated, nor have the fair sex ever been destitute of charms in these regions, since we learn that Roxana, whom Alexander married in Transoxiana, was the most beautiful woman whom the Greeks had seen in Asia after the wife of Darius. The inhabitant of the city, however, is more changed than the peasant, and on the mountains of Hindu Kush, we had among the Huzaras a much closer resemblance to the Tartars. Among them there is a singular tribe known by the name of Tatar Huzaras, which amount to about a thousand families and occupies the space between Hindu Kush and Bamiyan. Tradition states that these people to be descendants of Genghis Khan's army, but their name of Tartar deserves remark, since the only other tribe so denominated by the people themselves is the Nogai in the frontiers of Russia. Such is the mutability of men and things in this circle of Tartar abode that if you now ask for the race of Zagatai or Chagtai, the illustrious descendants of Genghis and the conquerors of Hind, and find them at all, they exist in the most abject poverty. The kings of Bokhara did, however, claim a lineage in uninterrupted descent from it, till a profligate minister snapped the thread by assassination. I wonder how many times that happened. The Uzbek ruler of Kokan, the second state in Transoxiana, still asserts his descent from Baber, whose paternal kingdom of Fergana he now inherits. The Uzbeks distinguish themselves by 32 tribes, into which they are said to have been divided in their pastoral seats. The following list exhibits a few of the principal divisions of the Uzbek race. Bokhara, Mungu, Kokan, Yuz, Hisar, Lake. Beysun, Kuadian, Kunduz, Kulum, Haibuk, Bialk, Maimuna, Orjunje, Kongrad, Dormun, Kutgun, Moatun, Kungli, Kipcha, Yabu, Ming, and Kongrad. If I butchered that, I apologize. Here we go. The roaming propensities of the Tartar occur in every page of his history. In the example of the Kalmuks, who returned in our own age from the Black Sea to their original seats on the frontiers of China, exhibits the wonderful facility with which erratic nations alter their places of abode. The event took place in the latter end of the last century and is still remembered by many of the inhabitants of Turkestan who described it to me. The colony advanced with their herds and flocks, and occupied, it is said, in the breadth of its advancing column, a journey of no less than three days. It forced its way through all opposition to the Dushti Ipkapchak, north of the Jaxartes, and reached the primeval seat of their ancestors at Yarkund and Ila. The Kalmuks are not Mohammedans, and the faithful made war on them as they passed, and about 1,500 Kalmuk slaves were added to the population of Bokhara, but small was the impression that could be made on the hundred thousand families, the reputed number of the migrators. The Kalmuk and Uzbek are said to have sprung from one tribe, and this change of habitation has now mingled it with the Kuzak, a great tribe that once lay to the eastward of it, and Kalmuks, Kuzaks, and Kyrgyzes are mingled together. The Kyrgyz and Kuzak appear to be much the same people, differing only in location. The Kyrgyzes, whom I met, had a flat countenance, 
and closely resemble the Turk moon. They inhabit Pamir. The Kuzaks pass the summer in the southern parts of Russia and repair in winter to the neighborhood of Bokhara, where they sell their sheep. We find a, as great a variety among the citizens of Turkestan as in the subdivisions of the Tartars. The aborigines of the country are the Tajiks or Tats, sometimes but erroneous, erroneously denominated Sart, which is a nickname given to them by the nomad tribes. The hostile Turks from the north subverted the power of this people in a remote age as different dynasties of the same hordes have overwhelmed each other. The Tajiks are addicted to commerce. Their language is Persian, which has long been that of the country, for Turkestan fell under the dominion of Persia before the age of the Caliphs. In a Persian manuscript, which I procured at Bokhara, I even find that this language was used by order of the Arabs themselves in converting the people to Islam. The number of Persians in Turkestan is great, since we hold the inhabitants of Merv in that light, as well as the slaves and their descendants. There are also Jews, Hindus, and Armenians. Of the Turkmuns I have already spoken, but there is yet another description of Tartars, the Nogais who have migrated from Russia and settled to the number of about a thousand families in the city of Bokhara. The people of northern Asia worship the sun, fire, and the elements previous to the age of Muhammad, and we are informed that in the earlier times of Islam, some of the priests or magi of Persia fled from that country beyond the Oxus. I searched much for a trace of the original or imported worship. The Uzbeks assured me that there were fire worshippers in the ancient Tartar city of Kazan in Russia. But the censor of the Greek Padre was probably mistaken for the altar of the Magi. But the similarity between the creed of the Tartar and the Persian was curious. And since we find such innumerable hordes issuing from beyond the Oxus in the ages of authentic history, may we not derive the creed of Zoroaster or Zoratusht from Scythia or Tartary? How full of interest is everything connected with races of man that have so often changed the destinies of the world? Could we but follow up that at which we have now glanced, we might gather from the traditions of the people much that would illustrate early history and the secret of these eruptions upon nations both barbarous and civilized. How much, too, might be traced from the shades of resemblance between the original tree and the branches which it has shot forth to stimulate an inquiry that is eminently attractive. I dismiss it, deploring my own incompetency. I like the way this guy writes. He's a very interesting guy. Makes me definitely want to read a lot more of his book. And I'll read the slave section in a second because that's pretty interesting, pretty fascinating. But talking about that, it's always interesting to get all these different groups of histories from these areas because so much is lost. It shows, again, how much, how quickly something can be lost when an invading force comes in, kills the top magi or kills the top whatever through assassination and then the people just kind of lose their will and or they get kind of taken over and intermingled. The books can all be burned by the upcoming hordes or whoever. They can just destroy everything. They can reclaim the history within a couple generations. It could happen so much. It's ridiculous. You really need to have total protection when you're in one of these powerful empires. And I guess that's why it makes, make, does make sense why they'd make fortifications. But how many people worked on these? How old are they? The descriptions, the visual symmetry of them. The power of these visual concepts to me these kind of drawings and these kind of uh, buildings and architecture and mosaic patterns always remind me of the closed eye visuals and patterns you can see on entheogens mushrooms and uh, beyond things that they've plucked from that world their spiritual world and brought into this world through meditation and clear practice because those are very precise they're so precise that they create create a visual illusion a visual power a visual energy that can't be denied and I wonder if all of these were covered with color at one point or if they were you know the clay bricks I have a feeling in their prime were painted with the same kind of patterns or tiled layered with mosaics covered with different colors gems metals rocks stones crystals anything to give it even more power and this is the prime I'm talking about which is so far before 1830s that it's ridiculous it just seems like there was the prime and then wars came, this invading force of evil just came and pummeled and broke things up, eradicated stuff, and just kept going all over the place, all over the world. And as I was searching on Google Earth too, I also began to think about, you know, just how easy it would be to 
to just have an entire civilization in any of those areas where you could just create everything. You could create a whole new religion, a whole new culture, a whole new way of life, a whole new everything, and just completely forbid them from moving. You could do it on an island, and you don't even need to. You could be in the middle of the desert somewhere where everything around them they see is just sand. They'd think they were in like a Truman Show or, or something. You, this, it would be so easy. It's so, it's such an interesting thought. Every time I scan Google Earth, something pops up. But here we go. Let's gonna continue with the one more part of this book that I want to read for you all. And here we go. So this is a chapter from another book, and it's on page 294. I think it's book two, but it might be book one. But here we go. He says, I expressed a wish soon after reaching Bokhara to see some of the unfortunate Russians who have been sold into this country. One evening, a stout and manly-looking person fell at my feet and kissed them. He was a Russian of the name Gregory Pulikov, who had been kidnapped when asleep at a Russian outpost about 25 years ago. He was the son of a soldier and now followed the trade of a carpenter. I made him sit down with us and give an account of his woes and condition. It was our dinner time, and the poor carpenter helped us to eat our palau. Though but ten years of age when captured, he yet retained his native language in the most ardent wish to return to his country. He paid seven tillas a year to his master, who allowed him to practice his trade and keep all he might earn beyond that sum. He had a wife and child, also slaves. I am well treated by my master, said he. I go where I choose, I associate with the people, and play the part of a Mohammedan. I appear happy, but my heart burns for my native land, where I would serve in the most despotic army with gladness. Could I but see it again, I would willingly die. I tell you my feelings, but I smother them from them the Uzbeks. I yet I am yet a Christian, here the poor fellow crossed himself after the manner of the Greek church, and I live among a people who detest with the utmost cordiality every individual of that creed. It is only for my own peace that I call myself a Mohammedan. The poor fellow had acquired all the habits and manners of an Uzbek, nor should I have been able to distinguish him but for his blue eyes, red beard, and fair skin. He inquired with much earnestness if there were any hopes of him and his comrades being released, but I could give him no further solace than the floating rumors which I had heard of the emperor's intention to suppress the traffic by an army. He told me that the last embassy to Bukhara under M. Negri had failed to effect that desired end, but that the sale of Russians had ceased in Bukhara for the last ten years. There were not 130 natives of Russia in the kingdom, but in Kiva their number increased as before. The whole of those in Bokhara would have been released by the ambassador had not some religious discussion arisen on the propriety of allowing Christians who had become Mohammedans to relapse into their, into their idolatry. The mullahs had seen the figures in the Greek church, and no argument will reverse what they state to be the evidence of their senses that the Russians worship idols. There is generally some difference of opinion on all points, and that of the Russians in Bokharis on the subject of slavery was much at variance. The Mohammedans are not sensible of any offense in enslaving the Russians, since they state that Russia herself exhibits the example of a whole country of slaves, particularly in the despotic government of her soldiery. If we purchase Russians, say they, the Russians buy the Kuzaks on our frontier, who are Mohammedans, and they tamper with these people by threats, bribery, and hopes to make them forsake their creed and become idolaters. Look, on the other hand, at the Russians in Bokhara, at their life, liberty, and comfort, and compare it with the black bread and unrelenting tyranny which they experience in their native country. Last, not least, they referred to their cruel banishment to Siberia, as they called it Siber, which they spoke of with shuddering horror, and stated that it had on some occasions driven Russians voluntarily to betake themselves to Bokhara. We shall not attempt to decide between the parties, but it is a melancholy reflection on the liberties of Russia that they admit of a comparison with the institutions of a Tartar kingdom, whose pity, it is proverbially said, is only upon a par with the tyranny of the Afghan. So, very interesting. They met that guy and had some details about that whole thing, because the Russians, the Tartars, whatever was going on before this time, it was really serious. Something happened in 1776, and it was far different from what we are taught in schools about the American Revolution. I think it involved everyone in the world and it was going on in every possible country and then only the winners kept the history alive and preserved it through fairy tale and extreme myth lie suppression and so much more 
all probably steered in some future direction so to lead us to what is happening now between Russia and America and everything. I wonder if there is an underlying ancient truth, an ancient kind of side line or main thread happening today in what we see with the evil versus the Russia versus the everyone versus the everyone else versus whoever that owns this company versus who it's just uh, it's insane and I wonder if how deep it goes how ancient it is if it's metaphysical as well which it seems like and uh, who knows what's going to happen next when 20 years from now what will it be will we be back to the primitive like the Tartars in this phase or will we continue to ascend and rid this place of the evil filth once and for all that has dominated and destroyed so much of what it makes us perfect and magical, incredible, unfathomably brilliant, incredibly masterful human beings. They have taken that away and robbed us by stealing from us our true history. They've done it so much. It's not just our past governments and the ones we've lived through. It's so many. So all we can do is wake people up to this reality make sure they know that we are so much better than they have been taught and told and that they should question everything history science it's all fake we got to find the real stuff in between the cracks and promote it and tell people about it and spread the word when it makes sense people get it common sense can't be ignored we got to resurrect it because it's been fried from a lot of the people but this ancient thread it continues now and the outcome is coming soon let's pray for a great awakening Bless you all.